I'm thankful to God that he's allowed all of you to have the health, the wherewithal, to get here to worship him, and we pray that our worship, first and foremost, as Joe mentioned in his Bible class, will please God. We're not here ourselves to be pleased. We pray that we'll be edified, but our number one mission is to just to glorify God and, of course, his son, Jesus Christ, and thank you for being a part of doing that very thing this morning. It's good to see we do have some visitors, as was mentioned this morning, and also good to have Jerry Lawson, always good to have him, and that smiling face, good-looking guy that I never got those looks. But you know what? <laughs> Who cares? Well, I do. No. Now, with that, would you turn your Bibles to the book of Psalms, chapter 103? Austin did a great job reading the 100th Psalm, and this is related to it, except this really expands on the Thanksgiving. We're to give to God, speaking of which I hope all of you did have a very nice Thanksgiving. Many of you got to see family, and even if you didn't, I pray God indeed blessed you, and I think most, if not all of you, would amen to that. Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. But he knows our frame. He remembers we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As the flower of the field, so he flourishes, but the wind, or for the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and his place remembers it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant, and to those who remember his commandments to do them. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you ministers of his, who do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Amen. Wow, amen indeed. As I sometimes comment to people, amen times a thousand. Did you know that that expression, bless the Lord, or his name is mentioned no less than seven times in this chapter? Bless the Lord. In fact, it's even mentioned in that scripture reading, Austin shared from Psalms 100. But what does that mean, bless the Lord? We know what it means when the Lord blesses us, or we should, but how about blessing Him? It means to praise, to glorify, to thank God. And you know what? Let me just share three reasons, although I suppose there are more than 30. Number one, we should praise, glorify, and thank the Lord because He is the giver of all blessings. I believe Corey mentioned that in his opening prayer. In fact, verse 2 Psalms 103, at the end of the verse, forget not all his benefits. That is all the good things, the advantages he gives to us. 
as his followers. James 1 verse 17 reads, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Number two, we should pray, glorify, and thank God because He not only blesses us, He loads us down with blessings. Psalm 68, 19 actually says that. Blessed be the Lord who daily loads us with benefits. You've seen movies, maybe commercials, of, of people, especially around the holidays, who are, who are coming out of a department store or mall, and they're just loaded down. They've got their hands full, and maybe they've got a shopping cart, and it's just full of cartons and gifts, many of them wrapped maybe, in, and you know, you notice how a person can even get to his car. He's trying to balance all of that, plus keep the cart from things tipping over. Well, you know, when you think about how much God gives to us every single day, we're just like that in a figurative way. He's just loading us down with blessing. It's just amazing how good He is to us. And then the third reason we should uh, praise and glorify and thank the Lord is because not doing so, not being thankful, is always associated with sin in the Bible. Always. For instance, Romans chapter 1, verse 21. The Apostle Paul is referencing here all those who deny God, ignore God, or just blatantly disobey God. He says, although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God. Nor, nor were they thankful. Unappreciative people are almost well, always disobedient to God. They don't thank Him for this blessing. The Apostle Paul, 2 Timothy 3, verse 2, he's talking about the various sins of mankind. He says men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful. That's a sin in the sight of God. And by the way, a part of the reason that is sinful in God's sight is because he wills, He desires, He wants us to be grateful for His blessings. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And there's many other reasons to be grateful. But this morning and tonight, I just want us to be even maybe a little more grateful than what we are by mentioning Eight blessings specifically mentioned in Psalms 103. Now, there are more than that eight, but we'll just try to cover those eight today for this morning and God willing for those who can return for tonight. All right, the first blessing mentioned at the beginning of verse three. And again, this is all Psalms 103. And I don't think you can come up with a greater blessing. <clears throat> who forgives all. Your iniquities. Some people believe that forgiving others is the most difficult or challenging thing a human being can do. Not forgiving others of everything necessarily, or I'm sorry, of anything. But there are certain things people can do to hurt us. It's just hard to forgive. And even harder sometimes to forget. But thanks be to God, no matter what we've done in the past, as His children through Jesus Christ. It's all been forgiven. In fact, in Psalms 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, how do you span that distance? So far He has removed our transgressions from us. In fact, Micah the prophet, Micah 7, verse 19, speaking of what God does, you will cast our sins into the depths of the sea. Do you know there's a spot in the Pacific Ocean that's 36,201 feet in depth? That's almost seven miles deep below sea level. Did you know that's almost 8,000 feet deeper than Mount Everest is high? 29,000 plus feet. That's where God cast our sins. And the idea there, so they will never be found, never be discovered. Now, any Christian who has repented of a sin, confessed that sin, and years later tries to bring up that sin to God, he would simply say, I have no idea what you're talking about. No matter how egregious the sin is, 
because he forgives all our iniquities. But of course, that would not be possible without Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10, verse 4, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. There's no sacrifice you and I can offer. There's no amount of money we can give, nor is there any amount of good works we can do to have even one sin forgiven. But through Jesus Christ. Romans 5, verse 6, For when we were still without strength, that's the human race, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Ungodly means just the opposite of godly. Jesus died for all. 1 John 3, verse 5, He was manifested to take away our sins. You know, to throw them, as it were, into the depth of the sea. Ephesians 1, verse 7, In Him, Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. And let's be thankful for that. I know we are, okay. But I wonder if we're as thankful as we should be, or could be. You know, verse 10, again, of Psalms 103, says, He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. You see, if He did, we wouldn't be here. We'd be burning in hell. Instead, we have an eternal home in heaven awaiting us. All the faithful saints of God, children of God through Jesus Christ. The second blessing for which we need to continually thank God. Verse 3, at the end of the verse, who heals all your diseases. Heals all your diseases. Let's think about that. How many times has God healed you or me by his power? Albeit with the assistance sometimes of doctors or medications or surgical procedures or hospitals. And he uses those things. God is ultimately the healer, the great healer. Jesus certainly demonstrated that. And I want you to I want you to remind you of something You know, when Jesus went about and healed every type of disease, every type of infirmity and handicap, why did he do it? Now, the first answer is obviously as a display, as a confirmation, in fact, that he is divine. He is the Son of God. But secondly, he did it because when he saw those people walking, limping, lying, or burning up with fever, or even demon-possessed, He was touched with compassion. I just want you to know that every time you are ill or going through something physical, it touches the heart of your Father in heaven. God has been so merciful to me. He's healed me or helped me, I'm sorry, to recover from more flus than I can count. Bouts with bronchitis. One bout right after I moved to West Virginia years ago. I'd only been there about two months, and I came down with the worst case of bronchitis. It may have been pneumonia, but I'll tell you what, I literally, and I've never been this way. Some of you understand this if you have asthma, what it is to fight for a breath or other lung issues. That's the first time in my life I ever experienced that, and I mean, it's frightening. And I could talk about acute allergic reactions, one of which put me in the hospital about 11 years ago. Third degree burns, broken bones, torn rotator cuff, torn ligaments. God has let me recover from. And some of you have had to deal with much worse than what I've just mentioned. And even at those times that we're not totally healed from those ailments, those pains, whatever, always remember how much worse it could be. That's something Ed Carpenter, every time I ask him how he's feeling, how are your ankles, your knees, whatever, he always says, well, it's not good, but it could be worse. You know, this Thanksgiving, this past Thanksgiving day, I couldn't help but think, I don't know what reminded me of it, that on that day, there were thousands of families, not at home, but in hospital rooms with little children that will never go home. And instead of feasting 
they had to endure stuff like that. It could be worse. But we just need to thank God continually for all He's done for us. And healing, restoring, or certainly helping things not to be worse than what they are. All right. Number three, a third blessing found in verse four. 103, Psalms 103. Who redeems your life from destruction. Or to put it as we would say, who has saved your life. Who knows how many times God has saved your life or mine? I mean, many of us have experienced some pretty harrowing events in our lives, circumstances. From very dangerous situations, very close calls, accidents, serious illness, things like fires, even criminal actions against us. Folks, you better know it. I can't speak for all, but the reason some of us are here today alive is not by luck, but by God. He has delivered us. David would say in Psalms 56, verse 13, You have delivered my soul from death. You have kept my feet from falling, that I may walk before God in the light of the living. Many of us are walking in the land of the living to this day by the grace and power and mercy of God. Paul puts it a little differently, but the same idea. First, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8. We, now speaking of the apostles, and to a degree this applies to all Christians, we are hard-pressed on every side. Yet not crushed. We are perplexed. But not in despair. Persecuted. But not forsaken. Struck down. But not destroyed. Thank God that we're able to be here. Albeit, we look forward to a much better place, don't we? And fourthly and lastly this morning, a great blessing mentioned, blessing mentioned in Psalms 103, verse 5. An obvious one, but maybe not as obvious as we think. Who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. And certainly to have more strength, energy, whatever we need to eat. So we talk about the food, the blessing of food. And how God has answered that prayer. You know, Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount, in that great example, that, that what we call the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. When was the last time you asked God that? Unless you just happened to pray the Lord's Prayer, that you said... We, we all, I hope, thank God for the food before we eat. But how many of us ask when we get up in the morning, God, give me this day what I need to eat. Well, someone has called this the most answered of unuttered prayers that God gives us so much to eat. Now, I can't speak for you, but I know as much as I try to thank God, I really have no idea. The blessing of food. As many as one billion people on earth right now. One billion people. I have a biscuit. One biscuit. One billion people on earth today. This will be their meal for this day. And it won't be handed to them on a silver platter. It won't be on the table when they get up to eat. They will have to beg for it, many of them, or search in discards from markets or restaurants or garbage bins. And it won't be nearly as fresh as this one. And that's all they will eat today. One other thing. There are probably over two hundred million people that this will be all they will eat for the next five days. Just one. You see, how could you live for five days having one biscuit? That's the point. Many of them will die. 
because this cannot keep them alive if I do. How blessed we are to have anything on our tables, let alone in our refrigerators or freezers. Are we grateful enough? I'm not. With God's help, I'll be more thankful, and I know you will be too. Well, we'll pause here and continue tonight. But I want to close with a true story from Paul Harvey's rest of the story. Many of you remember that years ago. How delightful some of those stories were, but all true. I've shared this before, but I can't resist doing it again. It is gratitude that prompted an old man to visit a broken pier on the eastern seacoast of Florida. Every Friday night until his death in 1973, he would return walking slowly, slightly stooped, with a large bucket of shrimp. The seagulls would flock to this old man, and he would feed them from his bucket. Other beach walkers often wondered why this old man was so kind to the gulls. Well, he had a good reason. Many years before, in October 1942, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker was on a mission in a B-17 to deliver an important message to General Douglas MacArthur in New Guinea. But there was an unexpected detour which would hurl Captain Eddie into the worst harrowing adventure of his life, somewhere over the South Pacific. The flying fortress became lost beyond the reach of radio. Fuel ran dangerously low, so the men were forced to ditch the plane in the ocean. For nearly a month, Captain Eddie and his handful of companions would fight the water and the weather and the scorching sun. They spent many sleepless nights recoiling as giant sharks rammed their rafts. The largest raft was nine by five, the biggest shark over ten feet long. But of all their enemies at sea, one proved most formidable, starvation. Eight days out, the rations were long gone or destroyed by the salt water. It would take a miracle to sustain them. And the miracle occurred. In Captain Eddie's own words, Cherry, the B-17 co-pilot, read the service that afternoon. It was apparently a Sunday afternoon, and they were worshiping on those rafts. And we finished with a prayer for deliverance and a hymn of praise. There was some talk, but it tapered off in the oppressive heat. With my hat pulled down over my eyes to keep out some of the glare, I dozed off. Something then landed on my head. And I instantly knew it was a seagull. I don't know how I knew, I just knew. And everyone else knew too. No one said a word, but peering out from under my hat brim, without moving my head, I could see the expression on their faces. They were staring at a gull. The gull meant food, if, if I could catch it. And the rest, they say, is history. Captain Eddie caught the gull. Its flesh was shared and eaten. Its intestines were used for bait to catch fish. The survivors were sustained and their hopes renewed because of a lone seagull uncharacteristically hundreds of miles, hundreds of miles from land offered itself as a sacrifice. And Captain Eddie made it. And now you also know that he never forgot that sacrifice as long as he lived because every Friday evening about sunset on a lonely stretch along the eastern Florida seacoast you could see this old man walking white-haired, bushy-eyebrowed, slightly bent with his bucket filled with shrimp to feed the gulls to remember That one, which on a day long past, gave up itself without struggle, like manna in the wilderness. So Christ, Hebrews 9.28, 
was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, that would be those who believe, who have obeyed the gospel, been baptized into Christ and walk after him. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. This morning, most of you are faithful Christians. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. But if you're not a Christian and you're ready to obey the gospel, to confess faith in Jesus Christ, to repent of your sins, then we'd be more than happy to baptize you into Christ. Or this morning, if you need our prayers for restoration, to come back to God, or just for something you're struggling with, you can also come and we'll pray for you. If you need to respond to the invitation, please come up as those of us who can stand and sing this song together.